Hello and welcome to video 5 for week 8. In this video we're going to define the next class of functions that we're going to study for the rest of the course for the remaining four weeks. I said it earlier in this course that what we're trying to do, a major goal of this course, is to extend the definitions of calculus to multivariable situations. We've already had parametric curves where we have one input and multiple outputs. We now want to talk about multiple inputs. And there are going to be two classes of functions that have multiple inputs. There are going to be scalar fields, which still have a single output, and there are going to be vector fields, which have a, a vector output as well. In this course, we are exclusively going to talk about scalar fields. Vector fields are going to be the subject for Math 305, where we're going to spend a lot of time to understand their behavior. They have lots and lots of interesting properties. They are the most difficult class of extension, of course, because we can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. But in the, for the remainder of this course, we're going to be looking at simply scalar fields, so multiple inputs and one output. And let me give you some quick examples. Potential energy of an object above the surface of the Earth is given by its mass times its gravity times its height if the convention that uh, an object sitting on the ground has potential energy is zero. Then if you raise it, its gain in potential energy is equal to mgh. This could be thought of as a function of three variables if the mass and the acceleration due to gravity and the height can change. Often acceleration due to gravity is constant, so maybe this is only a function of two variables, but it depends on mass and depends on height. Uh, in circuitry, uh, voltage is equal to current times resistance. So the voltage is a two-variable function. If you could change the current and you can change the resistance, then both of those are variables. We've seen uh, the force of gravity in earlier videos this week. We can write it as negative mmg divided by r squared. So it depends on the larger mass, depends on the smaller mass, depends on the radius between them. Uh, g is actually a constant, that is the gravitational constant, but we can still think of this as a function of three variables. So all of these are outputting one thing. So you multiply all these together, you get one number. Multiply these together, you get one number. Do this operation, get one number. So they all have a single output, but they have multiple inputs. And anything that is a scalar that depends on position, like the pressure at some point in the air or in the ocean, or the temperature at some point in the air, or the ocean, or some medium you're looking at, humidity, any other thing that you can measure that depends on positions x, y, and z can be thought of as a function from r3 to r, because it depends on three variables of position. And those are the type of things that we want to think about with scalar fields. And we can come up with a bunch of examples. Here's examples going from r2 to r. Anything we can write that's a function of the two variables whatever your creativity leads you to, these are all examples of scalar fields. They have two inputs, but only one output. We do some arithmetic with those inputs. And then we can ask domain questions, and domain questions look very much like they did before, which is say, for what values of both of the inputs is this thing valid? Well, there's no problems here. The domain's all of R2. Sign can be evaluated everywhere. The domain's all of R2. This is really weird because this depends on, uh, on what this base is. For some bases, lots of exponents aren't at all well defined. Uh, the exponent could be fractional, in which case if the base is negative, we get things like square roots and negative numbers. So some of these have really, really tricky domains because x and y can vary independently. How are we going to determine what that domain is going to be? So sometimes it's relatively reasonable. Sometimes it's quite hard. Back here, it's reasonable again. Here, both of these square roots need to be defined. So x and y independently have to be greater or equal zero. That's essentially going to give us this quadrant of R2, including the axes. Sometimes, though, the relationship is more connected. So here, the domain is going to be all things where x squared plus y squared is less than 4 in order for this square root to be defined. And that's going to turn out to be a circle of radius 4. So these domains can be all sorts of shapes in R4. It's just whatever we need for the expression to be defined. And la last in this video, I want to talk about graphs and visualizations, because we use graphs a great deal for single variable functions to see what's going on. So we still have the notion of a graph. So if we have the subset and, and a function defined on that subset, we still have the notion of the graph, but now the graph has multiple inputs. So the graph exists in one higher dimension where all of these inputs are charted and the output is charted. 
And that makes this really, really difficult because we're already getting into pretty large dimensions. However, at least for functions defined in R2, the graph now will be a graph in R3, and we can think of this as a height function. So we can think of R2 as a flat space where we have our domain, and then the function is gonna give us the height. And now it's not gonna be like a single line, it's more gonna be like a surface of heights above all of our input values that sit in R2, which we think of as sort of flat and the outputs as the heights above them. So for an example, here's the graph of five divided by x squared plus y squared plus one. So at the origin when x and y are both zero, we're gonna have a height of five. And then as x and y get larger, uh, this is always gonna be positive. So this is gonna decay down in all directions from this peak in the middle. And it moves off in, in all directions, extends infinitely over the whole plane. But this gives us a notion of this function being a height function above a flat x and y plane, output being sort of the z direction. Now we can only do this for functions of two variables, because as soon as we have functions of more variables, we can't actually see the space in which the graph would exist. The graph still exists, we can still perhaps talk about it, but it's no longer a thing that's useful for visualization. We have another technique instead of drawing graphs, because drawing 3D graphs is pretty difficult. Sometimes we'll just draw what happens when the value of the function is a constant and see what kind of shape we get there. And those are called contours, and for higher dimensions, they're often called level sets. So these are places where the output of the function is constant. And I'm gonna use the same function I has befo had before and draw its contours. And you should really think of this as a topographical map so that we have a contour of five at the, at the origin. And as we move out, we have these heights. At height four, we're at this circle. At height three, we're at this circle. At height two, we're at this circle. At height one, we're at that circle. So this is descending as we go further and further out um, in this contour plot. And then we can label whatever these are, uh, whatever these lower elevations are, and really think of this as an elevation map. The key point being that these lines are derived by setting this equal to a constant and seeing what we have. And contour plots can have all sorts of interesting shapes and interesting properties. Here's something called a saddle point. If, we, if these are getting higher in this direction and these are getting lower in this direction, then we have a situation where this is sort of a pass that we can walk up and then go over here. This is gonna be going up, this is gonna be up, these are gonna be going both down in that direction, we get a kind of saddle shape out of this. And we can have all sorts of more complicated shapes, and more complicated behaviors, but the contour graphs are a pretty nice way of visualizing things, different from the conventional graphs of our function, but still things that we can access just by setting the function equal to a variety of constants and see what, seeing what kind of shapes we get. It looks like here I've got hyperbolas, so maybe setting my function equal to c gives me a whole bunch of different hyperbola shapes, and those shapes get put together in this diagram, giving me this, this thing that lets me actually sort of visualize a, a saddle point, visualize a place where the function goes up to one direction, goes up, goes down in other directions, and, and has a property that I can, I can visualize a little bit via these contours.